Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Speculative Speculations. I'm Varsha. I'm Steve. I'm Jared. And I'm Chris. And this is a sci-fi podcast where we talk about sci-fi stories in all their forms. Today's discussion is going to be about um, Nightfall by As- Isaac Asimov, which I um, bullied, I mean convinced um, all the others to read uh, because it's one of my favorite <laughs> stories from reading it about a decade ago. And uh, The Evolution of Science, which is in the short story collection by Ted Chang called uh, The Stories of Your Life and Others. Uh, we are continuing our read in the Ted Chang collection today as well. So Chris, Steve, Jared, how's everyone doing? And how did you all like Nightfall? <laughs> Who wants to go first? <laughs> I liked it. I liked it myself. Uh, it reminded me of uh, of uh, there's a certain style that was in in vogue back in the uh, 30s and early 40s, and uh, it took me back to that style. And I I kind of uh, I dug it. It's been a while since I read something like that. So nice, nice. <laughs> I thought it was. I thought it was fine. I thought, I thought it was okay. It was a little long, I think, for some of the ideas mm. that, that were presented in it. I kind of felt like by the time we got halfway through the story, I'd kind of got a sense of what they were going on. Although it, it obviously did develop in kind of the last three pages kind of put it together, but it felt like there was a lot of kind of moving around, moving pieces of, of like maybe three or four characters that were, that were actually needed in the story to tell, to tell the story that they wanted. But uh, I mean, it was fine. I enjoyed it uh, for, for what it was. Yeah, this one I, I thought, like you said, Chris. I think it was, a, and I feel bad saying the short story was long. Like it's, it seems like I, you know, I feel like an asshole saying that, but, um, <laughs> but no, I, I think, like you said, I, there was a lot in the beginning that I just felt like wasn't really. I don't know what it really accomplished. It didn't really set anything up. It didn't really, um, it didn't really do anything for me. But by the end of the story, I was like, wow, that's pretty cool like that's pretty neat I, I like by the end i thought that's an interesting story i thought that was it made me think i'm still thinking about it so on one hand i, I thought it, was, it could have been tightened up but i did like the the style i think it, it kind of brought me back like you said jared it kind of made me uh you know kind of want to read more stories from that time period uh so yeah it was it, overall i liked it What do you love about it, Russia? What's your what's your takeaway, especially in a reread? So I think I kind of agree with the maybe it was too long bit because when I I, I read it online, there was some HTML page or something. So I didn't really realize how long it was when I was reading it the first time I read it. So I was surprised to see that it was 40 pages because I didn't think that it had 40 pages worth of story to tell from what I remembered of it. So I'm, I maybe kind of agree with that assessment. What I and, and also, I think this might have been one of the first sci-fi stories I read. Um, I, I don't think I'd read a lot of sci-fi before this. So this idea of a world with six suns where they never see darkness, I thought that was absolutely brilliant. And I, I kept thinking about it for days on end. A lot of sci- sci-fi stories do that to me, I've realized since. That was, since it was one of the first sci-fi stories. It, it hit really hard. And I think I think what I love about sci-fi stories, again, I love these uh, explorations or ideas of what other planets might look like. For instance, something with a binary star. Or in the story, they have a moon and they don't even know it. Um, and the science <laughs> science feels similar to but just different so it feels like an excellent thought experiment and i'm i'm really into that kind of stuff so i love that and on a reread this time i think i i can't say i grew attached like i i, I can't say i liked any of the characters but i was immediately interested in all of them as soon as they were introduced um compared to some other stories I've been reading recently, like I, I'll read pages and pages of a novel. And I still can't bring myself to care about some characters. But in a short story, pretty much everyone who was introduced, um, I immediately was interested. And, and I was 
trying to figure out why, for instance, the the uh, director is that is that his title of the university? He has this belligerent lip <laughs> when he's introduced, and the the psychologist who for some reason is the one telling the reporter everything, uh, he's he's really amusing as a person. So they all have they're not just there to do service to what the author wants to tell. It's also some character effort there. So I really enjoyed that this time. And I think just I'm a different reader now and it different parts stood out to me. I think the first time it was just the raw idea, but now even the execution of the story I thought was absolutely brilliant. Like it still, it stands up <laughs> a decade later, so. Yeah, well, it's written written in 41. So it, it I think it uh, stands up pretty well eight decades later. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> as a story <laughs> that bit's quite stunning jared like that's exactly the point i was just about to make as well like yeah. 1941 like I, yeah. I can't even conceive having only very limited like you think of all of the things that that we've had influences around science fiction whether visually or written or otherwise but in 1941 that is just what would work to you? I didn't finish for crying out loud when they were running up the tanks throughout the middle of the road. You know, that was the that was the height of war for, for at that time, you know. So mm. these kind of really big ideas and big theories about what it would be like. Well, fully the story's kind of about them wondering what our earth is like, you know, it's sort of like an outside world looking at us because a lot of things are theorizing about are things that that obviously are, are common to us but that, that idea of actually why would somebody think that or or where are they coming from when they when they think that our world is strange whereas we're obviously reading it and thinking the other way around yeah it made me think back to i think we've talked about this before about these older science fiction stories are less about characters like there's characters but it's more about the ideas and the kind of like you know, kind of an exploration, like you said, for like a thought experiment. But I, I did wonder, like, I, I guess I never thought of it, like, what, what, how would we, how would we react to darkness if we'd never experienced it before? And how would that warp or how would that change our view of everything if we hadn't seen stars before, if we hadn't, if we had that, that uh, kind of that, that, uh, you know, kind of that perspective of what else is out there? Because it's just seeing the stars kind of makes you feel small. I think even, even back in like, you know, Neanderthal days, you look in the sky and you're like, wow, there's a lot of stuff up there. Like, it's not just you. So it mm. changes your perspective on how you view everything. But I did wonder, and maybe I just missed this, but how does, how does the planet's rotation work with six suns? Wouldn't they get close to some sun eventually? Like, cause the sun's way more than maybe I'm thinking too much into this, but doesn't, the suns have more mass than the planet, I'm guessing. So how would that rotation work? But I, that's not the point of the story. I'm just you know, curious. <laughs> I, I was doing yeah. a lot of that as well around temperature, especially especially as the suns are coming out. And the, the thing that people would notice most of all is the difference in temperature You know, during the day. The things would get from very warm to very cold or otherwise. But I tried to just park that part of my brain and go, that's not the point of this story. But it, it was sort of lingering in the background a little bit, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, he definitely doesn't get into that. I, I, it's uh, it's funny. A lot of the characters. I wonder, um, I wonder what Asimov was was. Um, it, it seems like the characters he was choosing to portray were kind of like almost caricatures of certain positions in society, mm. and because he has his he has a psychologist he has a reporter he has a uh, psychiatrist and he has his uh the director of a university and they and just by the way they react to each other and they talk to each other they seem like they're the you know the the representations of those positions in society and so he has those different uh those different positions as a uh, viewpoint towards the end of the world, basically, and uh, that's that's kind of what I like what he did. What he did with the characters, and uh, I thought that was uh, um, I thought that was amusing, and at the same time, uh, very apt for the story. Yeah, and and with that, I think he also managed to um, make a point about each 
position in society. For instance, mm-hmm. how the reporter runs this smear campaign for two months and it turns out he doesn't even know what it is he's <laughs> running this campaign against. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, not that all reporters are like that, but you know, it's it's a commentary on a certain state of mind, let's say that we can unfortunately yeah. relate a lot to lately. So fake uh, news, eh? <laughs> it was around back then too, yeah. 1941 <laughs> propaganda. Yeah. So yeah, that, that was pretty cool. I thought um, I didn't I didn't fully understand um, or agree with the fact that the psychologist is the one who explains because quote unquote the physicist won't do it without graphs and charts. Like okay, <laughs> <laughs> like that's what I was wondering because it's like it's like he he must have known a physicist who was who was like that and he used that like caricature of a physicist like. I can't explain this without grass and shots. <laughs> and I, I thought that was uh, a slightly amusing part of the story. At least. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> pretty yeah. funny. That was pretty funny. I'm, I'm assuming it's like supposed to be humor, humorous, right? Like, you know, the, the uh, you can't just relate to the normal everyday person. He's, you know, goes too far. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I even think about the state of textbooks for schools in those days, like the, um, the texts were not made to be read by the layman all the time. They were, they were very kind of very heavy in terms of content and uh, how they explain theories and stuff. It is not like there was no analogy or metaphor kind of put in the thing like this. It was very graphs and charts and, and diagrams mm-hmm. and uh, Greek language and letters and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so the implication is that the psychologist synthesized the information. <laughs> better than <laughs> the astronomer was able to explain it to them. <laughs> um, but yeah. But the, I, yes, mm-hmm. that, that idea of claustrophobia that was explored quite a lot in the, in the story as well, that the absence of light actually, or maybe the plethora of light meant that they never really felt claustrophobia in their entire life. And I was, I was trying to wrap my head around that going, really? Uh, is that a thing? And especially how they were sort of explaining claustrophobia, because to me, claustrophobia is about personal space rather than uh, anything else. But again, I was like, that is an interesting viewpoint to kind of take on that and to prefer that with that and kind of explore through through that short story, because it obviously wasn't part of the big part, but big point that it was yeah. trying to make, but it was also like this nearly like sub uh, conversation that, that it was trying to have. Yeah, yeah. That I, I, I was, I found myself wondering about do they they mention caves and they mention the fact that fire is the only other way they know to generate light and they don't think of it as light they think of it as heat because they have apparently no need for light in this world so (laughs) (laughs) it's yeah i found myself wondering is does your architecture not allow for dark rooms or do you not have like slightly lighter or darker rooms and also apparently um when there's just one sun in the sky, they feel colder. So um, they also must have less light in that case. So unless it's their primary sun, which they said they revolve around alpha, right? So all the other five suns have to be at some sort of distance, maybe? Or are they all somehow close enough to the planet that they all provide light? And then when all six are in the sky, if that ever happens, it's blazing insanity <laughs> yeah it, it it's fun to imagine right yeah and all the, it was cool because all the suns were giving off a different color of light mm. you know the beta sun yeah. was giving off red and there's a lot of there's a lot of mention of red uh like he uses the red color red a lot in the story to describe some different things and then uh like one of the characters say, oh, I give anything for a decent dose of white light just for a <laughs> second, you know, because that those suns are not there right now. And uh, I thought that was uh, so it's like these these different suns give the different spectrums of color for the, for the light that that they're uh, um, they're seeing. And uh, and that's that's a interesting idea because we you know we kind of get all the colors but <laughs> mm-hmm. i uh, found that fascinating mm-hmm. or or they get so much light that they're able to distinguish between the various ranges and it yeah, matters maybe. to them which one they get like we have night and dark they have uh spectra that they experience perhaps mm. yeah that that was 
interesting for sure. What did you think of the cultists and the book of revelations? I, that was fascinating too, that whole, um, the religion based in reality or myth based in some reality, but twisted for, <laughs> to build a cult around it. Yeah, that, that aspect was really interesting too, I thought. Yeah, it's, it's, I don't know how to, um, cause they're like the cult is a kind of right because the world is going to end. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I'm trying to remember what the, um, what the conflict was between them and the, and the scientists. Um, I think the scientists explained, <laughs> um, the, why what the cult claims is going to happen like the apocalypse they had a scientific right, yeah. explanation for it so they negated the need for the religion apparently and also i i don't think this is explicitly stated but it sounds like the religion says you only obtain salvation if you look at the stars and they know from past experience that looking at the stars or just experiencing darkness is going to drive everyone mad or most of civilization mad so they're trying to take action to prevent that, but the cultists want <laughs> uh, salvation. So they want everyone to follow their religion and look at the right, stars. Yeah. Instead of, uh, yeah, right. Instead of hiding out in the bunker where, mm -hmm. where, where like their families yeah. and stuff were, they were trying to uh, get everybody to be outside and experience the, you know, rapture yeah. or whatever it was. And, uh, <laughs> uh but, uh, and that was fascinating because they were they, like the scientists were also trying to um store knowledge too they were trying to get as much knowledge as they could and store that for you know the next cycle or whatever the next uh rise of humanity you'd be after the uh the dark years what have you and um it makes it, it made you really wonder how much the last civilization saved for these guys, you know, over the mm. thousand, two thousand years, whatever it was, that um, that this uh, this cycle seems to go on, uh, and I thought he raised that, I, Asimov raised that question. Uh, it was like a really cool question, but there's no real solid answer there. Mm. Uh, he lets you speculate on your own um, how much knowledge was saved from the last time, and how much knowledge these guys are trying to save now. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. The the reporter, the reporter, it was, I think, who raised that important question of the book of revelations exists. So somebody, somebody was sane enough to write it down and pass it along. So which also makes the point about, well, I suppose they want, um, it's unclear whether the cult also wants the insanity to happen, or if they think the insanity is the salvation. But if that is part of their belief system then whoever wrote it either wrote it in an insane state of mind <laughs> or um wasn't really like the cult originator wasn't following the same belief system perhaps hmm. but it, but it is that eternal question of science and the miracles of science some people will try to explain as being scientific and other people say they're acts of god and uh, when I was doing a bit of background reading, I did find out the inspiration for the story, which was a conversation and a, a quote from a poem uh, by Ralph Waldo Emerson. It says, if the stars should appear one night in a thousand years, how would men believe and adore and preserve for many generations the remembrance of the city of God? And the idea that if, if an act happened only once in, in, a, in a couple of generations, so to speak, or 10 generations, as it may be, then actually how would man interpret that? You know, they would almost certainly see it as divine in mm -hmm. some way, or some something of really of of import and and meaning something, and therefore cults and religions, etc., would follow that that idea. Especially if it if it came back around and it literally happened on a date every thousands of years, you know. And yeah. this the story kind of seems to answer that question in the poem. No, uh, that there is a cult <laughs> that is kept alive for these 20 2500 or 2050 years whatever the number was this cult is keeping the belief alive 
but also apparently the cycle they are currently in scientific thought is considered supreme so so uh, the public wants to lynch the scientists for agreeing with the cultists so so that also and um, so that's an interesting question do you think our society would get to a point where science is more primary than religion I'll just I'll just throw out climate change there for you because it's the <laughs> the existential question that, that that half the world is gone you can't be serious and the other half's going well it's just really cold or really warm. <laughs> I think um, when you I think anything when you mix belief in with any idea whether it's science you can you can prove science right there's that's why it's science because you can prove your facts but when you start adding belief into anything then you can warp anything into whatever fits your belief so you may be based on facts but you can warp it into something else when you add your own personal beliefs into it because you you mix those two together so it it, it may start off as science and as fact but then it can get warped and turned into something else or you can become uh, aggressive or uh, change your um, your approach to things i guess you can become like militant i guess if if someone doesn't agree so then it becomes something else right so it's it's an interesting thing. Mm, yeah yeah it it might be in theory possible to take science to the point of zealotry as well which mm. uh, is presume is what they're saying effectively right mm -hmm. that that the public wants is turning against the scientists for agreeing with the cult so yeah that, that's pretty cool <laughs> scary and, stuff yeah <laughs> is, is it is that like human nature though is that will we always find a way to to warp in at some point to warp things into our own belief system is that just what we do whether we consciously or not yeah that's 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 been the um that's been the pattern so far you know yeah. <laughs> uh we would we you would hope that we uh will eventually evolve to you know beyond that need to um to uh you know have that kind of uh what you're saying about taking that taking one thing and then changing it to fit your worldview uh i mean the point of science is that you're supposed to be willing to correct what has gone on before by continuous improvement and it's okay for science to be wrong because they can with new information comes new data comes comes a better science whereas uh religion tends to take one idea and just stick with it and then anything that's against that kind of is not uh not allowed <laughs> i guess i guess you can also i guess religions also evolve too right because religions have to adapt to the current kind of the current yeah, you know, yeah. so religions evolve too i mean what yeah well they have to adapt uh right. be too societal pressure um right. uh, you know otherwise uh they would risk uh being uh, extinct themselves mm -hmm. yeah and, and i and i think the story had a great example of that tension like, i didn't think of it that way but it's really cool right the science as religion versus the scientists are still objective to the point where they are willing to agree with and back the theories of their arch nemesis potentially with the cult so that's, that's a really cool way to think about it yeah <laughs> and i thought it was amusing how it was kind of like well we got four hours um what do you want to talk about <laughs> and and like one guy's like no no don't drink don't drink i'll be i'd be like what do you mean it's four hours left <laughs> That's when you crack open your uh, your bottled mead beer, Jared. Oh, oh yeah, Let's absolutely. Yeah. That probably would have been gone by four hours by oh. that time. <laughs> I was trying to think how cool it would be if the the two people who so who used up their life savings to buy a house and fill it up with velvet. <laughs> it turned out that it wasn't actually the end of the world. <laughs> <laughs> it kinda happens now too, right? I mean, people you know prepare yeah. for 2012 because the mind said so and then it's like yeah okay what now <laughs> you know like, whoops what I, now? 
Yeah, there was a yeah. bunch of crazy stuff going on with the Y two K stuff, you know. But that's <laughs> right. And I mean, I don't like even back then. Like you know, I didn't believe the world's going to end, but I, there was so much like talk around it that was like, what will happen? Like, yeah. <laughs> start to kind of like question, like, you know, is this the end? But then you, of course, you go back to your, you know, your semi-rational monkey brain, and like, no, we'll be fine. It's just like an arbitrary year. Like the planet doesn't know what year it is. But then you think, well, th no, maybe you know, like <laughs> so it, it it gets to you. Yeah, I I really like that movie. Was it? It was an ice age. That was the animated one, but there was another one that had the world freezing over because um, the Look ice age came tomorrow. Out. Yes, that I I love that movie, but um, I don't know if I still like it. But I loved it when I watched it what a decade ago. <laughs> you love that uh, extinction level events. Okay, that's that's interesting. <laughs> Do you know what that one? <laughs> which extinction movie I? Not to get too far off topic, but what extinction movie that I, I didn't have any really hope for, but it turned out to be I, will, I think it's been a while since I watched it. But knowing with Nicolas Cage, oh, like yeah, turned out yeah. to be kind of a cool movie. Um I'm not a big Nicolas Cage fan, but he's not the he's not Nicolas Cage in that one. He's like it's Nicolas, I think he's in that one. But yeah, it's, it's solar flares. I thought that was kind of neat. Cool. I got I gotta check that out. <laughs> I was I was joking about how New York is the city that gets destroyed in every apocalyptic movie. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I think it has like the biggest building. Like I think mm. it's so it, visually we we recognize like it has this um, it has this kind of like it's everyone pretty much everyone knows this New York City. So and there's mm. lots of buildings you can like destroy lots yeah. of things and lots, <laughs> lots of people in a small place. So when you see that destroyed, it's like wow, that's mm. they mean business. <laughs> the Statue of Liberty froze and broke in two. Mm -hmm. mm. Chris brought this up a little bit during the intro, but the cute notions they have of how science in our world would work. And also mm -hmm. they think that there'll be um, 12 stars. <laughs> and that was so funny and so brilliant too. Like uh, what I really appreciated about the story is except for maybe one thing that I can't now remember off the top of my head, but uh, all of the speculations felt right, right? Like the fact that people might go mad if they aren't subject to darkness. The uh, Binay's uh, speculation that, oh, but then they'll go, they can't, you can't have life there because they'll have darkness once a day but you know we are used to darkness <laughs> because of that so like except for that it all felt like things that could happen like if a world like this existed this makes sense right so um yeah they've they've not they've never not seen light so they think that <laughs> when Binay says, "Don't, don't, don't try to get multiple. Don't, don't waste time trying to get multiple at a time. Just get the one star. Whatever you can get is fine." <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I even like how they experimented with that. Like they, they threw a guy. <laughs> they made a dark room and they threw a guy in there. And, uh, and uh, I thought that was uh, that was yeah. it was very fun. It was it was fun. It was, it was interesting and fun to read. <laughs> Hmm. Yeah, it's it's almost like the scientists thought the stars are what drive you mad, while there's a psychologist sitting right there and telling you <laughs> that that I mean, not the psychologist isn't a scientist. Like the astronomers thought the stars are what will drive you mad, but the the psychologist is like the darkness will drive you mad first, mm -hmm. and then the stars are just there for um, what for seasoning. But it turns out actually maybe it's the stars that. <laughs> also drive people mad because the infinity that they have had no reason to imagine so far is now made visible to them. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I thought that bit was beautifully written. I, I highlighted a lot for like discussion point, but I highlighted a lot of, oh, this is so beautiful, such pretty sentences here. So I thought that last bit about the darkness was and, and the stars was wonderfully done. But I can see a lot of that even, like I don't know about all of you, but certainly if you if you live in a city and you look up and see stars, you only see a certain amount. And it's only on the times when you either move out of the city and go to a bit of clearer. And then like there is something that catches in, in your throat 
when you actually see a perfectly clear sky and see the depth of stars that are there, mm. it is something that is one of those classic things that makes you feel entirely non-existent as a person. You know, like you're such a dot in the world and uh, you yeah. see the depth. Whereas, you know, uh, through the smog and through the general hum of light of a city, you only see so much. You know, it's it's, it's a thing of all the stars. That's okay. But yeah. so I, I, could, I could feel... The connection and the point that they were making in the story from that even though you know the, the kind of idea of that oh my god look at what actually is out there you know hmm. yeah yeah getting through the light pollution is uh yeah. a wondrous <laughs> thing i mean it's it's uh when when you're out there in an area that has no you know no sense of other light and you're seeing that and to the point where you can almost see because it's only the stars uh it's it's uh it's sublime it can be sublime mm -hmm. and uh that word gets overused a lot but that's is the true sense of it right there that great vastness yeah that before you you know it's almost overwhelming right it's almost yeah. like too much and i think in, even in the story they they discuss kind of the you like we they can't wrap their heads around um just like the you know they think the the universe or the space is only a certain it's they don't have the they can't almost like wrap their mind around space and how vast and even now that we know how vast space it's hard to even now <laughs> you talk about light years and you you talk about the the universe and and all, all these and it's like how do you even put that in your even now like how do you it's just yeah. a lot you know it's it, it you is, wrap your mind around that it, it, it really is tough to get a real grasp on just how big it is. It's, it, it's, it really, it's, 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 uh, yeah, ungraspable, really. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They think, they think that eight light years uh, diameter would make them feel insignificant. And <laughs> assuming right. they're looking at the same That's universe right. we are. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No, it's 16 billion. <laughs> Try 16 billion. <laughs> um, yeah. Drop in the bucket. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um I I forgot what else I was going to say. But yeah, I think that was that was it. <laughs> the eight light years yeah. thing. I, I did wonder how not that I know how this is done in our in our world, but um I have to go read up about it. But how they got to the point where they measured the speed of light because light years assumes that you thought about speed of light and so I'm, I was trying to think what the sequence of events where that led to humans thinking about how fast light travels and what the corresponding situation might be given they never experienced darkness um, but also the 3600 stars that apparently we see from earth or visible to the naked eye is that is that really the number is that all we can see with the naked eye i don't know yeah i'm not sure about that um figure mm. 3600 stars yeah yeah i mean that would be a lot to count but i'm sure somebody has <laughs> <laughs> You know, some grad students being put to. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a PhD right there. <laughs> I mean, if you think in the big scheme of things, of all of the PhDs you could do, that's probably one of the easiest. You know, I, I'm just going to count the stars. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> why and didn't I think of it first? <laughs> you can write a paper about how you grouped out the sky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Such a the line. Yeah. yeah. The line I like at the end mm. here is, uh, in the instant, the awful splendor of the indifferent stars leads mm. nearer to them. I thought that was a great line at the end. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That, <laughs> I, I think that's the one I meant when I was talking about it earlier. That, yeah, it's absolutely brilliant. I love that. And there was a few other lines, too. Um, but I think there's something about how Gamma uh, shone desperately or something like that in last desperate time or something like that it was, it was brilliant and interestingly the so the volume i have for these stories the asimov's written a preface to each story and in this one he talks about well first he shares his gripe that everybody considers nightfall his favorite story 
but he's written several afterwards and he has to have improved as a writer <laughs> and why is nobody acknowledging that <laughs> uh, but, but every, every writer's dilemma <laughs> <laughs> but um he also mentions how he thinks that he doesn't know to write or rather that he's he doesn't consciously like try to write or he something to the effect that he doesn't come consider himself a writer he just puts together, <laughs> together stories or something like that and i was like dude <laughs> you have no no business <laughs> claiming these things when you've got such beautiful words in your story and, <laughs> and of course i i think the story he's done a fantastic job like you i have <laughs> haven't been shy about talking about how this is my favorite but yeah <laughs> i <laughs> Uh, there was one other thing that I wanted to bring up, but I forgot how I went into the tangent of talking about Asimov saying he doesn't know how to write. Nope, that's it. <laughs> that's... Cool. Any any other thoughts about this story? <laughs> yeah. Not for me. <laughs> no, I think we're good. No, it, uh, very thought provoking though. I, I did wonder how do they handle sleep? Mm, yeah, and 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 I and I had a difficult time trying to figure a hideout that is well lit because hideouts by definition are in the basement and dark and dank, <laughs> and yeah, their hideout had to be well lit apparently or like somewhere well lit. Mm. Yeah, sleep. What do they sleep whenever there's just one sun in the sky, or is that even a thing that they do? So. Yeah, that, those are all interesting questions. It's fun, though. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah. Was. Yeah. I like it. Cool. Are we ready to move on to the next story, which is called... <laughs> <laughs> I'm seeing some strange faces around. <laughs> um, it's called The Evolution of Science, which seems apt for the subject that we've been discussing so far in the context of Nightfall. Yeah. What did you all think? Well, it was just uh, something that uh, it seemed like it was just something he thought of real quick and spit it out on the page and then moved on. <laughs> pages long. <laughs> I think that was literally the idea because he wrote it for a scientific journal, didn't he? According to the the story notes at the back, so it was very much you know he was asked to contribute to a scientific journal. He thought, what can I write about? And he just kind of had an I a thought or an idea and and spat it out. It it. It is again interesting given the conversation about AI and stuff that we, the conversation we have all of the time at the moment. And the kind of unusually, I think, for a Chang story, it sort of comes to a conclusion at the end to say, you know, while machine learning and machines are all good, they don't necessarily think of things that are worth exploring or things that are actually interesting. They have involved that point, which I thought was an, an interesting point to get to get to at the end for sure. Right. Mm. And there's a uh digital neural transfer that was the yes, uh, dnts yeah dnts and so that he but he calls them meta humans um yes so like I'm, i was thinking they were kind of like androids or something i don't know but um yeah but yeah you're right that's uh that's that's exactly i think the little point he was making is like uh we still need we still need humans no matter what no matter what uh technologies come out and stuff we still need humans do we though that's <laughs> <laughs> much humans you don't need all of them <laughs> probably not <laughs> <laughs> applications accepted <laughs> <laughs> What yeah. do you think, Steve? Sorry, go ahead, go ahead, Chris. I was just going to say, there was a hell of a lot of jargon in this. For us being only five pages long or six pages long, it was dense. And at a certain point, it just kind of, I started to reread paragraphs and I went, there's no point. This is technical <laughs> jargon. Like the DNTs is made up almost certainly, you know, all of that stuff is is very much, it's its, its own thing. I was like, let's get to the end. It's only five, six pages long. If we get to the end and I'm still not sure what it's about, I'll go back and read it again. But it, uh, thankfully, it came out all right. Yeah, yeah. I think the first time I read it, I skimmed. Um, 
and then I reread it with a bit of detail, but I'm not sure that was necessary. The reread, <laughs> the reread wasn't really necessary. But I think for how short it is, and once again, if we think of these stories as not, you know, great, um, wonderful, hi, <laughs> great uh, stories that are supposed to like make us engage with characters and so on and so forth. Uh, Steve's dog came <laughs> came on, so we're saying. The <laughs> <laughs> like, Pause the podcast. We don't need it. Getting some D and T. Well, maybe we need dogs more than we need humans. That's yeah. true. <laughs> maybe they are the meta humans. <laughs> they, yeah, they can use the scientific research that humans produce, or vice versa. Maybe, maybe they produce some scientific research that we need to understand. <laughs> It definitely lends credence to the idea that dogs are just biding their time. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> they're plotting. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it was kind of a rosy view of um of the future, where that there was like there was wasn't it like that there was no more need for uh mm -hmm. like everything was taken care of, um mm -hmm. you know for uh, hum humanity's needs. So uh, that was kind of like a utopia uh, viewpoint. Hmm. Is it utopian though? That's the kind of point. Is is wow. is there is there a part of that that people go, uh, where do I fit in? Do we end up in a Wally -E state where everybody just yeah relaxes and doesn't contribute to society, and therefore society stagnates? Yeah, that's that is the fear that, yeah. uh, which is why I think he said that, um, they still need humans to. Yeah uh you know offer a bridge across because the the uh the dnts are not able to we'll, we'll overlook things humans can re discern applications overlooked by by many humans because they're not they don't have any sense of uh striving to be greater because they're already programmed i guess to be as great as they are it is interesting because I think machines will always strive for efficiency rather than mm. something new. Like I think it's very much in their nature yeah. to be efficient rather than than uh, look for right. advantages or, or opportunities. Yeah, and, and the, the the issue is: do, do you mistake efficiency for the greatest good? It's efficiency yeah. is good for what it is, but it's not the only thing, and uh, that's you know machines aren't going to get that. Indeed. Does it does it also read to a certain extent like an apology for humans or like trying to justify the existence of or trying to justify the usefulness of human or at least the human researchers, but potentially for humans in general in this world, maybe it's gotten to that point. Um, but yeah, it yeah, I was saying earlier that for how short it is, in terms of the number of things it made me think about, I thought, I thought it was pretty pretty brilliant. But yeah, it's not super interesting as a story. But in terms of ideas, again, I, I thought it it was really good. I'm, I'm glad we had this talk because I, I read that and I had zero takeaway. <laughs> what? <laughs> I just think uh, I was afraid to say this so because I was afraid you'd, you'd all exile me from the podcast. But... Uh, <laughs> I, I just i just feel like it's it, i don't know i i think it's because of last week's uh, last week's story that i was a little lost into i just feel like sometimes all the jargon feels like it's like needless like i just feel like it's like a little over the top um but i don't know maybe i'm just a numbskull maybe that's what it is you know you're something to that steve it, it, some of the jargon i like I speed read over that. I mm. the jargon itself, I just I'm like, yeah, okay, and I look for the point in the paragraph that the jargon's referring to, you know. And I, uh, I'm not a, I'm definitely not a jargon maniac either. <laughs> I, I'll be honest. I found that with both stories this week. Like mm. I, I found Nightfall very like that, and it, it was. It was probably more in Nightfall where it could kind of tangibly go, well, actually, I can see and, and visualize some of that, whereas this was literally all just jargon, and it was almost like a technical manual in some places mm -hmm. uh, at some point, and I was like, right, well. 
what, 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 what actually is it, where's this going and literally it was a bit like cities in flight uh, we got the last page and i was like okay we got something out of this that was good uh but before <laughs> that i was like right okay i'm not i'm not sure I'm not sure where we're going with this or what what we should be looking at this for so hmm yeah, I think for that reason, it's good that it was as short as it was. Yeah. Um, but mm -hmm. I think from another standpoint, it and the corresponding example I can think of is the first short story in the Ken Liu collection, The Paper Menagerie. Mm -hmm. um, I forget what it's called. I think it's all the ways that and something about how all, every civilization keeps books or writes. Oh, yeah. Books. Yeah. And, and that I think was very similar in structure to not structure, but uh, how it felt yes. to this story, because it felt like a journal report, something that you might publish an article about, or maybe a newspaper article, um, or like a survey research paper. So this feels a bit like that, not not a research paper, perhaps, but just a news news article or an opinion piece. And so it it's interesting because short stories and maybe novels in general also like there are all these formats that you can choose to write stories in like i, I know there are some you know just just a bunch of people exchanging letters um so I, I think these are educative in terms of style or structure about the things you can do especially with short stories um make it look like this and you've made a short crisp point it's not super interesting to read but it's more interesting to read than, say, if a real life newspaper article was published like this. So, yeah, I, I, I thought it's interesting for that reason as well. It's a very good point. Yeah, that is a good point. There's, uh, I think it's, it speaks to the versatility of short, short fiction. Like a lot of these cases, but like you say, you can have a short story that's 50 pages long. You can have a short story pages five pages long. And a lot of time you come away with one thought at the end of it. And... Some people might look at other stories and go, but those other 45 pages worth it if that if the point that you were going to make was just this, for instance. But uh, yeah, there wasn't an awful lot else to hang on or get on to because of its shortness, but it was supposed to be in a scientific journal. So uh, when I read that, I actually found my frustration being the wrong word, but my confusion as to what pur purpose it was serving, it made an awful lot more sense because it was literally lifted and from that audience and it was intended for a certain audience and then put in this collection. So I was like, right, okay wasn't really for me <laughs> <laughs> what was nightfall originally published in you know I, was it the astounding science fiction magazine was it a magazine okay all right yeah that makes the, sense the sci-fi sci magazines i think a lot of the short stories that we'll read from that time were published in magazines right yeah that's what i thought yeah yeah okay. so i have one more uh topic to discuss from this story you know um the thing about how parents are uh have to decide whether to oh, yes. give their children meta human abilities but that means that they can't communicate with their children anymore so Oof. i feel like that's creating an additional bridge in society and also <laughs> creating another parent child dynamic where potentially children can go on to blame their parents for not choosing <laughs> what they <laughs> wish they had when they grow up. So yeah, I, th I thought that was an interesting philosophical question again that this story raised. Kind of reminded me of Gattaca a little bit. Who? Gattaca. Yeah. The, the, the movie, yeah. Hmm. yeah, yeah, no, I see that. Yeah, that, that they were choosing uh, certain traits for their... Yeah. Uh, for their children in that movie yeah and that's uh i didn't even i didn't even remember that from this little short thing that's uh that's interesting that um you could choose to have your child be a meta human with mm. with uh, dnt um but then uh what kind of i don't know why would you want to be that separated from your from your child where your child goes into a advanced state that you can't even be a part of that's uh i'm not sure about that statement <laughs> well, yeah. i think it's, it speaks to like you know you you want your your you want them to be competitive and be successful and right if, yeah. if you don't give if you don't elect to have that done 
then what will it do to them later in the future? And will they be able to live in this new world? Are you being selfish for not doing it? Mm-hmm. So it's that, you know, back and forth. Yeah, it's, that's a, that's a quite the conundrum actually. Cause, um, uh, but he didn't make it seem like humans were on any kind of lesser status as far as, as far as, um, being able to live a, a full life. Uh, so that's a good question. Yeah. But maybe, maybe the article was written by a human who's trying to justify that humans are just as good as the meta humans. <laughs> um, You're right. <laughs> and, and that may or may not be true. <laughs> so. mm-hmm. You're right. Yeah. We need a counterpoint article. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> some some meta human who's full of himself. <laughs> Do you know anybody? <laughs> <laughs> Calling Chat <Dad> GPT. <laughs> oh dear. Oh man. Yeah. But it, it, it's it's again, it's a point he explores in the story of my life as well as for your life, whatever whatever that's called in terms of communicating between parents and, and children and about the structure of family and, and how he, you know, he's sort of cynical, I think, about that relationship and, you know, obviously based on experience, I think it's some ways um, about whether it's worth persevering and preserving that um, at a certain mm-hmm. stage of your life, especially if the, in, in a future society where kids are going to be more mobile, they're going to be have access to technology changes, the very nature of relationship, all of those things. Know what, what if we go 100 years down the line, what does this function of family look like within society? You know? mm. Mm. And I mean, in, in some ways, parents are deciding the kids' entire future, which you know, like parents do, <laughs> but also it, it feels like a very important decision. And I think that's what they conclude with that we need a gap so that it's not something you need at childhood and then you cut off your relationship with your parents altogether uh you can still get it as an adult so um yeah it, and and they did say that the the number of parents choosing the hermeneutics is that what it was called uh is zero which okay so, um but yeah that Cynical ish, I guess it, it's a possibility, but apparently, not a lot of parents are choosing that. Right. Yeah, interesting. Well, that's cool. that's a lot for five pages, huh? Right? It's, it's actually <laughs> only three pages. The oh, five pages four, are because yeah. of two blank pages in the right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, any other closing thoughts before we uh, wrap up? No. Cool. Um, in that case, I'll see everyone in a week from now. We um, haven't decided what to read yet. We'll post the stories in the description once we decide. Or, you know, these episodes are going to come out in a batch. Maybe um, wait for the next one. But um, <laughs> we'll know what we're reading by the time we post the episodes. I will post it in the description in case you'd like to read before you listen. Um, thank you so much for listening. We'll see you in the next one. Bye. Bye.